Hi, I'm Enid from Girls School, and you're listening to the Mosh Pit on Sin. This is Stefan, and you're listening to the Mosh Pit on Sin, and we have some rock royalty for you. Girls School are one of the most beloved new wave of British heavy metal bands, and we have just re- and they have just released their 13th studio album, Guilty as Sin. And on the line, we have Enid Williams, bass player and one of the lead vocalists. Welcome to Mosh Pit, Enid. Hi, great to be here. Thank you. Now, um, Enid, I know you're, you're just a schoolgirl, but you've been a young schoolgirl for a very long time. So what's your take on performing and recording as schoolgirl since, you know, year one back in 1978? <laughs> Girl school. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're a bit beyond schoolgirls. Uh, that was a very, very long time ago. <laughs> and performing, you know, back, you know, I guess like, um, how, how do you see things from when you first started in 78 to the way things are now? Well, that's a, um, a very, very long time. We're heading towards 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, from from which point of view? From the business point of view or from, from musical point of view? Yeah, I guess like mu- uh, music point of view because um, I know that uh, when uh, the late uh, Kelly first left the band, she was over rock and roll at that point. And f- for you, is the heart of rock and roll and metal and punk still, does that, does that burn deep inside you? I think music in general does. And, and this is what we do. It's... I can't, I can't imagine, you, know, you don't retire as a musician. I, well, I, I don't see how you can. It's like if you want to play music, it's something, it, it's something you have to do. It's something uh, that you can't necessarily rationalise. You think, what, what the hell am I putting myself through this when you set the alarm for four in the morning to, to go to the airport to, uh, to fly to a festival or something? You think, oh, this is torture. But, but you, it's the music that drives you on. And of course, things have changed an enormous amount in the last 40 years that the whole way that uh, bands get signed up and it's much more egalitarian now. So it's far, far harder to break a band and to, to have a large audience. But um, it's music is more accessible. You can live anywhere in the world and make your own music on uh, on your computer and, and edit your own videos and, and sell it and you can do the whole thing, and that's very liberating. But you have to work eighteen hours a day. The the actual music, um, the the record companies and the bands that are signed, and that side of the music business has has just completely um, radically changed. In from our point of view, the audiences that we get, we still have a lot of people, say in their forties, early fifties, who remember the band first time round and came to see us. But with the internet, we found that we get loads and loads of 21-year-olds that have discovered our music just from, yeah, have just found it. And uh, we get loads and loads of younger people coming to gigs as well as the older ones, which is fantastic. And that makes us feel relevant, makes us feel that there's still people out there that, that want to hear what we do. And uh, I know I, I can't imagine not doing it, not playing music. It's it's just unimaginable. And back to the uh, uh, younger people. So it could be like, say, people who been to your gigs from the very beginning, perhaps bringing their kids to to the to the um, to the gigs as well. Well, it's it's both. I remember when we were touring with Motorhead in I think it was about 2009. And then before that, in 2004, and we were playing theatres sort of two, three thousand um, capacity theatres with them. And you'd look out in the audience and there would be quite a lot of teenagers with somebody much older. So clearly it was the people that had had known Motorhead the first time were bringing their teenagers along. But in many of the of the gigs that we've done ourselves, particularly in in clubs where you can't come in when you're 16, if it's a 21 year old, they're going to be coming by themselves because they found you on the internet. If it's a 16 year old or well, maybe 14 year old, they're going to be coming to a theatre gig with their their mum or dad possibly so it's it's a mixture but it's fantastic but i mean it's it's brilliant when somebody comes along and says well your album was the first one i bought and so you know that you've you have some meaning in that person's life and they come along maybe from a for an element of nostalgia and to feel young again and to to sing along with music that they they grew up with but with the with the younger audiences it's completely um, completely different that the way that they find our our music, but it's fantastic to have have both. 
If we go um, to your new record, Guilty as Sin, it's your first record of new material since 2008. So what has the reaction been to the new songs? Well, it's it's been fantastic. It's quite a varied album. It's a, perhaps a, a little bit more... Um, Perhaps a, a little bit more m- melodic, a little less heavy than the the previous original album, Legacy. Although I do love that album, um, I couldn't say one above the other, to be honest with you. But it, it's been a very, very positive reaction. Um, there's quite a wide variety of, of music on the album. We have three main writers, and we always have done, and... We tend to have different tastes, particularly Kim and myself. We often like different kinds of music. And so we're all, we write what we love and then we all throw it into the mix and go, no, I want this song, no, I want this song. And then we somehow, it somehow comes together from that, well, it's like a mosh pit of (laughs) all throwing our songs in. So there's, if, looking back on the album, you, you don't quite know what it's going to be when you start off. We didn't have some master plan, but it's almost like it's it's a homage to everything that we've listened to and loved and to some extent played over the years. And you can hear influences from the 70s, the 80s, the noughties and, and so forth. And there's quite a wide variety. And we're finding that people go, I really like the album, but these are the tracks that I love. And then somebody else will say completely different set of tracks. There's one or two that come up constantly, but it seems to be an album where um, different songs seem to be people's favourites. So uh, that's, yeah, we're very happy with it. And you've got the Staying Alive cover too. So why did you um, decide to uh, cover that song? Because that's a that's a very you've done a very interesting take on it. I I found. <laughs> well, it's it's been a tradition in girls' school that we've always done a cover, and in fact, "Race with the Devil" has become one of our most popular songs. Um, and of course, with with Motorhead, we did "Please Don't Touch." So every time we do an album, there's one cover on it. And if you cover a rock song, it's difficult to to know how to improve it. Sometimes we cover songs trying to think back on all the all the tracks but if you have it a little bit similar to the original nothing wrong with that but th- what's the point there's nothing particularly creative about reproducing something and just tweaking it slightly so to take a song from a different genre is much more exciting but less obvious to see if, to know if it's going to work or not and it was actually the manager that suggested it we were throwing a lot of songs around and um I guess half the band went, no, you're out of your mind. And the other half, uh, which included me, went, no, I think that's a great idea because the actual riff itself is is great. Every girls' school song, more or less, has got a strong riff to it. I mean, that's part of, of rock and, and metal. And the majority of rock and metal songs have got a, a great guitar riff. That's part of the part of the mix. So it had the riff. And that really, that really sort of made it. And the thing that I was most concerned about was the lyrics, because I had this picture in my head of John Travolta walking down the road with his paint pot and going, how am I going to relate to a guy in his 20s in New York who goes out clubbing at the weekend to make, to give his life meaning? It, it, it It's, it's going to be ridiculous. I've got nothing in common. But the whole principle of staying alive obviously Lemmy's died, Kelly's died. Many people in our age group have, have gone by the way over the, over the years and you become more aware of, of your mortality and also the way that music has, has changed so much, you have to adapt and, and do things differently. And yet somehow, after nearly 40 years, we're still here, both in terms of we're still alive. <laughs> People have health problems as, as they get older and you become more aware of, is it going to be me next? And so physically we're alive. And as a band, we're still somehow here. And it's against all the odds. So the, the lyrically, it became a song of survival, very different to the survival of, of a guy in his 20s trying to get by in a crappy job. But it's still that sense of, of defiance against expectations of who you should be as a woman, uh, who you should be at a particular age, what is considered sensible or appropriate. It's defiance and survival. And that song really became quite, quite meaningful. 
Um, and then, of course, we, we took a completely different approach. And I, I think it's really turned out really well. Mm, I agree. So now we have to ask about Lemmy, of course. Now, uh, Girl School often compared to Motorhead. You guys uh, toured and recorded together. Can you describe your own personal relationship with the great man himself? Well, you'd probably get different answers from different members of the band. He was mm-hmm. uh, obviously uh, a great fun to be around. And uh, we first met Lemmy in 79. We had a single out on an independent label we're doing gigs. And uh, it was picked up by John Peel, who broke so many bands. And he was playing us on his nighttime show on Radio 1. And Motorhead's manager heard it. And so we got... Uh, we got to meet the great Lemmy, he came along to a rehearsal and he was brilliant. It was like, yeah, the girls are great. They can do it. It didn't matter. Um, it was just about the music, really. He was so, so supportive of us and he's been very supportive of, of women over the years. So we went on tour with Mohead originally in 79. Then in 81, we did the single together and we had a real, real laugh. But I think from my point of view, which perhaps is a little different to the others, it was like Motorhead went on the road every year. They had an album out nearly every year and he worked really, really hard. He always had time for the fans. And you don't always think of of a, a musician as working really hard because he was he had an image as such a party animal. And he, he did. He always had a bottle of Jack Daniels in his hand. There were always r- women flocked around him and he enjoyed his life and he had a great time. But there was a really... It sounds so unrock and roll, but there was a really strong work ethic there, and I I had enormous respect for the man. Uh, but but yeah, there's some great times, but I think the um, the best ones are probably unrepeatable. <laughs> now um, you left you left the band for a period of time. So what was that, and what led you to come back? Um, well. When when the split happened earlier on, it was quite acrimonious, and we were quite young. And I think that I'd felt a lot of frustration. There was frustration on both sides, but I was singing less and less, and I love singing. I was also, my my greatest passion has always been writing. And Kim and Kelly made such a strong team that there wasn't much space left. So it wasn't working. Um, And during that 18 and a half year period, I was working. I worked with a guy called um, Dave Parsons from Sham Sixty Nine. We we had a band, and I I did loads of different things, experimenting, writing, learning my craft. And then I went and did a post grad. Then I did some, wrote some operas. Then I had musical theatre. Got into astrology teaching. Eighteen and a half years go by, and I was acting, and. I love doing these actor musician shows, but you have to sing somebody else's songs and and say their words and you have to repeat the same thing night by night. And that's when you get a job. And I felt very much beholden to other people. And I wanted to, to do my own writing and have a bit more freedom. So Kelly left the band. Um, she took Tracy, um, she got Tracy out of the band, left herself and then... Kim and Denise were by themselves. This was 99. And I I felt, okay, I've loved the last show that I did. I don't think I'm going to top that. And I just want a bit more freedom. I want to do my own thing. And Kim said, do you want to do the band? And I thought, yeah, yeah, that would be great. I I felt passionate about it again. And uh, so, yeah, came back. Never expected it for one minute, but it just felt the right thing to do. And I think that, that there being more space to to contribute to the writing side was was a massive part of it for me. Awesome. So uh, what's your take on the whole new Wobbum label that people place on your band? Well, people people can place whatever label they want. We get called heavy metal and sometimes we refer to ourselves in that way. And we have a very, I suppose it's, the guitars tend to be pretty loud. And so it, it's got a metal sound a lot of the time. But our melodies are quite strong. We're quite sometimes even poppy very, very occasionally. But we're, we're essentially a rock band, a heavy rock band. So it doesn't matter. Some of the songs are heavy metal. Some of the songs, are, you could say, are pop. Heavy rock is probably the most accurate label. But what is a label? 
the new wave of British heavy metal was very much about those bands that came up at the end of the 70s who had grown up, um, of course, Lemmy was a little older, but, but had grown up to some extent with Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, those great rock bands. And then we were getting ELP and, yes, um, great musicians, but it wasn't, it didn't have the spirit of rock and roll. It wasn't about that, go to a club and get down and dirty and, and off your face and have a brilliant night out. It became a bit sort of muso, pseudo classical. Uh, I love classical, but I'd rather listen to Beethoven than, than yes. So it then punk came along and the spirit of punk was anyone can do it. Anyone can pick up a guitar, play three chords and no one yeah it was it had the aliveness and the spirit of the original rock and roll of the late 50s which was very much three chords and it brought that back that DIY attitude that um if I want to do it I'm gonna do it and the the freshness and energy of the music and so we'd grown up with the with the rock music that got more and more complex and more and more stadium based and but we love that music still. And then the energy of punk and the excitement and the attitude and the two came together. And that was a new wave of British heavy metal. And certainly Iron Maiden were radically different to Motorhead and Saxon again and Def Leppard ended up in, in a very American sort of sound. But we were all of that mixed genre of uh, of, of the two kinds of music that came together and that very much inspired us. And we were, were going out gigging and making albums during that period. So we all came under that umbrella. Awesome. Now, uh, is Girls School going to tour Australia anytime soon? Well, I, I can't say 100% for sure, uh, but we've had about five full starts where we've nearly come and then it's not been possible. It's really a lot of it is to do with the with the finance of actually being able to <laughs> to to get us over there. Um, but it's looking extremely promising. Uh, we're closer than we've ever been, and uh, it may well happen. Oh, I so can't say more than that, but um, it's looking Australia very before. very promising. You haven't so, been to uh, Australia before. As no, the really, the man hasn't no, been. No, I mean it's outrageous. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know that. Wow. You gotta, you gotta get, you no, gotta, you gotta I, start I think some memories. There is a very, a very, very high probability that um, maybe in six months or so that we'll we'll make it, but it's not 100% signed, sealed, and delivered. So uh, I err on the side of caution here. Wow. Uh, so what do you like to do uh, when you're not playing music? <laughs> well, I'm also an astrologer, and uh, that's a big part of my life. I do it professionally. Uh, alongside the music, uh, in fact, I wrote a piece on on Lemmy. It's uh, there's a little astrological jargon in there, but uh, if anyone's interested, it's on my website, which is Enid Williams in my name and Astrology Lemmy, uh, rock astrology. I, I write a lot of astrology about rock musicians, and I've written a piece about uh, uh, Paul Rogers for a book that's coming out next month, and a um, number of articles from magazines and so forth. So. That's a big, big passion of, of mine. And uh, aside from that, I'm a keen gardener. I've got a 200-foot garden uh, where I've moved to. I've moved just out of London and uh, got a little cherry orchard now and I grow a lot of my vegetables, wood burner, uh, solar panels. I'm, some of the songs on the album are quite political and a couple of them anyway and a couple of, of certainly of my lyrics uh, treasure and perfect storm have allude to climate change there um and that's very very much a big issue i mean you've had some massive fires in australia and uh, there's a uh, real drought problems in la and california it's it's a, a huge part of um because I'm, I'm essentially pagan really which is uh, a love of nature a love of the earth and uh yeah, I adore gardening. Kim's a keen gardener as well. So uh, that's a, another big passion. Awesome. Well, yeah. uh, la last question. Uh, what's cooking. Oh, yeah, cooking. Oh, yeah. Oh, Co so cooking. I love cooking. Uh, yeah, especially stuff from the garden. But, yeah. 
Awesome. Well, our last question is, uh, what's your take on the rock and metal scene today? Or is there any like bands that you like, newer bands that you'd like to name drop as well? <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm going, well, uh, probably the last band that I can name drop is still 20 years old. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, today's yeah, music, what do you think of that's it? That's a difficult one. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't think... I don't think there's that many new bands that I'm listening to at the moment. I feel really embarrassed to say that. <laughs> but uh, who do you recommend? Oh, who do I recommend? Uh, listen to uh, King Parrot. They're a, they're, a Mel- they're a Melbourne band. They're really great. I don't know. I was supposed to. I was supposed to get some answers from you, but now I'm, now I can't think of any myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. um, the last the last time we got asked that question, I think we all said, "Oh." Um, Foo Fighters and Ramstein. Um, are we going? That's a very long time ago. <laughs> That's true. Twenty years for both of them. But it, I think. It's, <laughs> it's true. I, I think the Foo Fighters are, are great, and of course they're not cutting edge music. But the that um, eight hours of film that they did for their album, the principle of, of recording in a different studio with recording a different song in a different studio for their album and then being inspired by each city. I thought that was an absolute masterstroke. So the music was so, it was just completely original way of doing something and really inspiring. So although they're not, you know, absolute cutting edge music, I think that the the way they went about that was absolutely brilliant. And to be honest with you, right now, I'm not listening to anything except Bowie. And he was uh, he was probably the biggest influence of all on my wanting to play music. He was a massive, massive influence on both Kelly and Kim as well. So <laughs> it seems strange listening to, to tracks from the 70s, but they sound so fresh and so original still compared to a lot of other stuff. Of course. Um, so I'm waiting for something to come along and uh, really, really blow me away. What's your favourite track, uh, just quickly, from Guilty uh, Guilty as Sin? <laughs> That's quite difficult to answer. I'll probably uh, change my mind on different days. I suppose... I like Take It Like a Band the best. Yeah? Well, the, the most popular songs from that we get people choose different songs uh, but that's a very very popular one probably the number one song from across the board has been come the revolution mm. that's the the favorite take it like a band um is very 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 popular treasure and night before um, have been mentioned a few times uh, i'll go with come the revolution uh but yeah Come the Revolution and Take It Like a Band are the two that we, we played on stage on the, the Motorhead gigs that we did. So, uh, okay. so yeah, they're, awesome. they're two of the favourites. Well, thanks so much for joining us on the Mosh Pit, Enid, and uh, enjoy the rest of your morning, and I hope, hope you come to Australia soon. Oh, we're, we're very, very much hoping to. Thank mm. you. Awesome, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Goodbye. Cheers. Bye.